Okay, welcome everybody. Um, looking over the chat, me and Ergus noticed that I don't think anybody's from the same country, which is awesome. If somebody finds out that they're from the same country, that's great. We'll send them a copy of Ergus' book. That'll be the reward. <laughs> So welcome everybody. My name is Parker Rogers. I am your host of Ergus workshop today. If you attended the last workshop, it was amazing. So we had to bring Ergus back and I will add a link to that workshop. If you'd like to watch it, it was a uh, sequel patterns. Every analyst should know where Ergus taught us all about sequel patterns that he's written about and applied in his career. So you can copy and paste that link and uh, you can watch it on YouTube whenever you'd like. Additionally, this event is hosted by the Operational Analytics Club, which I help run. And if you would like to join, you can click that link. Um, we have over 15,000 data professionals like Ergus. So it's a great resource to improve your technical data expertise, grow your career, and network with great people like Ergus. With no further ado, Ergus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Parker. And thank you to the Operational Analytics Club <clears throat> for hosting another wonderful live workshop. Um, and this one is on an, another pet topic of mine, which is data modeling. Um, and data modeling is one of these things that has been around for decades. Um, and yet folks still are learning about it um, in this day and age. And DBT has sort of done um, a lot of good work uh, for those of you who use dbt uh, it has done an, uh, it has done a tremendous amount of work to kind of bring data modeling back into the fold back into the data professionals um, toolbox if you will uh, this workshop is specifically about designing um, what i'm calling a business blueprint uh, but it, that's that's not my terminology there's a book um, actually that you might find useful um, and, and it's, it's about business knowledge blueprints. Um, it's, it's, it's all about you know, how to actually think about how business people think about the business in terms of the, the, the concepts and the verbs and, 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 and the entities. And we'll cover some of that stuff in this workshop, but um, I, I'm, I'm bringing that, that up as, a, as an introduction. Um, Let's, so the agenda for today is, I'll talk a little bit, of, a little bit about who I am, uh, what my background is, how I came to be kind of um, in this data space in the last 15 years or so. Um, we'll talk a little, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what modeling is, uh, why should you model different types of models. Um, <clears throat> then we'll talk about some of the common uh, physical models. So there's three, three different types of models, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Uh, uh, the last one is the physical model. This is where you create tables and views in a database. Um, and some of the ones that you may have seen, you know, the one big table or the wide table, uh, Kimball dimensional modeling or the star schema, some, some of the relational models like the, um, the third normal form that uh, Bill Inman uh, wrote about in the early to mid nineties. Um, Bill Inman is also known as the father of the data warehouse. He has a book on data warehouses. Uh, so it's, that's, that's another resource. I'll, I'll, I'll provide some of the resource, some resources, um, at the end, some books for you to, to check out. Um, and then we'll cover some of the newer ones, um, a little bit, uh, the activity stream, uh, being, uh, one of them. And finally, we'll do a wrap up, we'll do some answer some questions um, and kind of give you some resources about what to do next. So a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I have a computer science degree, um, but um, I, I, I kind of got um, a, an internship right out of college and I was asked to write a, a piece of software and I, struggled with it quite a bit, kind of thinking like, how the heck did I get a computer science degree when I don't really know how to actually program? And so I, I didn't quite enjoy being like a full-time engineer. So for a while I was a little bit lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, with my career. 
um, I should have said career, not life, but uh, you, you get the gist. Um, so what do you do when you don't know what to do? You go back to school and you get an MBA. I do not recommend getting an MBA um, unless you're getting some other benefits out of it, like maybe your company is paying for it and you get the title, um, or you go to a really good school, like say Harvard or, or Sloan or Stanford, one, one of these schools where you can actually network and build yourself, um, find yourself peers. So went back to school, got an MBA. The benefit for me was that I, I met uh, a, a friend, a colleague there, a, a classmate who kind of brought me into his company part-time and said, hey, we're looking for this, this technical person to do some like uh, business analysis type of stuff. I didn't know what that was. So I joined part-time. I started helping them and just sort of stumbled upon the field of data. Um, and immediately I learned SQL and kind of like fell in love with the engineering aspect of data and SQL. Now in my career, I've done pretty much the whole gamut of, of, of data. I've done, you know, data analytics. Um, I've done some uh, data science. I've done, I've done data engineering, um, mostly data engineering and what's known today as analytics engineering and what was known back then as business intelligence development or business intelligence um, engineering. So this space has been around for a very long time. And so I, I immediately fell in love with this, with this, uh, with this space and sort of even today, 15 plus years later, I still enjoy writing SQL. Um, and I also discovered that I enjoy explaining technical, technical things to non-technical users. And so I became this sort of um, conduit person between the business users and the technical users. And so you know, part of being a, a business analyst, you kind of have to gather requirements from the business people and then provide them back to the engineers. In today's day and age, it's sort of known as a product manager, which I also tried as a career and I did not like. Um, I gave that up after two years. Anyways, that's enough about me. Let's start talking about data modeling. What the heck is it? It's such a such a vast topic that I, I tried to put together a course, like a four-week course on this, and I could not narrow down the scope. Uh, and so I abandoned the project. I've abandoned that project twice. But when, when Parker and, and the OA came to me with the idea of doing a quick workshop, I said, oh, I could totally do kind of an overview of the, of the, of the topic. And this is basically what this workshop is. Um, this is an overview of the, what data modeling is. So why should we model um, data in the first place, um, right? One of the most important things that data modeling does, it sort of, it maps important business concepts back into data. The whole purpose of data modeling is to map important business concepts like a customer, a product, a sale, a transaction, an account, um, uh, web traffic, all these things. These are concepts that the business cares about, but the data doesn't know anything about it. So by modeling data, you are sort of creating, you're mapping the, the, the business concept, the definition back onto the data. And by that, what you're doing is you're imbuing raw data with meaning and significance. Now, why is this important? Well, it, it's important because this data represents uh, what the business actually cares about. Like the, it represents customer behavior. Uh, it, it represents reporting that, that the business cares about in terms of like, you know, how many sales uh, they've gotten or where sales are uh, doing well versus not doing so well. And then another thing that it does is it, it organizes this raw data that you get all this, um, like what you, what you get from, from the website, you, you might be getting all these events, all these raw uh, data logs, and you, you're trying to optimize all this raw data, both for storage. So you don't want to uh, store all these logs raw as is, because it's really hard to process. So you, you ideally want to kind of pre-process the logs um, through some transformation with SQL probably. 
in order to, to optimize it both for storage and for retrieval. And by retrieval, we're talking about writing SQL queries that get the data that you want really quickly, right? Get all the reporting done really quickly. And of course, modeling is important because it makes possible all the metrics and, and calculations and all the analysis that, you, that the, the business actually cares about, like sales volume, um, annual recurring revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, what modeling does that's really, really important that I find does not get talked about at all in the industry is this idea of integrating data from multiple sources. So let's say you have um, a CRM system like a Salesforce or HubSpot and you, you have customer data there and then you have like a, a ticketing system that the customer service reps are dealing with and that you, you have data there as well. And then maybe you had your website where you have your, your product and you have some data there. Well, so this concept of a customer crosses all these systems. So a, a, a customer, you, you wanna be able to kind of combine all these data sets from all these different sources into a single kind of view of the customer that has all the attributes that you care about for a customer, right? Because to the business, you know, it, 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 they don't care that you have, you know, HubSpot or Salesforce uh, or Shopify or what have you. They care about the customer and what did the customer purchase and what did the customer do on the website before purchasing? Uh, what, what emails did the customer open? What kind of tickets did they create and how, how soon did that issue get resolved? Like all these things are very, very important to the business, but this information lives in, in separate sources. And so the idea of modeling data, you're kind of stitching together all these different um, disparate sources into a singular system. And uh, lastly, modeling facilitates uh, the ability to go deep dive into the data and look for insights and do experimentation. So if you have all your data loaded, um, all the raw data loaded in, in your data lake, for example, if you're using one of those platforms, um, you <clears throat> might want to go in and um, other than your standardized reporting, which you have already probably done. So the executive dashboards that, that all the executives get emailed on um, every, every day, that's, all, that's already done, but maybe you want to go in into the data and look for things that might be interesting, like, um, coming up with a new model, like a, a new machine learning model that did not exist before, um, or coming up with different insights about the data. Um, and uh, I guess I, I, I have more stuff here. Uh, I said finally before, so this is not quite yet finally. Uh, I, think this is, I think this is the last one. Um, the operationalization of data is the last, but not the least important of things that data modeling actually um, en enables, right? It, it, it enables the ability for you to take this customer profile that you have created in your data warehouse that you've stitched from various different sources and feed it back to an operational system, maybe like an email service provider um, or maybe some kind of system uh, that you some kind of CDP customer data platform or, um, that allows you to reach specific customers with on specific segments with specific offers, right? So that's that's another important aspect of um, of data modeling. So uh, I sort of see data modeling as two these two different types, like top down and bottom up. And I'll explain what those things are. So bottom-up modeling is when you start with raw data in your data lake and you kind of create um, kind of like your staging layer, then you create your, you know, your silver layer, and finally you turn it into something like the, um, the gold layer for, for aggregates. Um, and this is a very 
typical approach that you might see. And it has very good, uh, it has these great benefits because you can get started really quickly, right? You, you can get started, you can create these dashboards. It's very easy to deliver value. Um, and it's also great for exploratory data and data analysis, um, as well as creating reports you know, before product market fit. Uh, if a company is still ex exploring their business model, they haven't quite settled on anything yet, but they have a bunch of raw data, you can do bottom-up modeling because you don't know what concepts are important to the business just yet. But there are some very important drawbacks, and I've seen this in my career multiple times. The most um, egregious of these is that if you don't have this overall blueprint for the business, things get very messy, very complex, very quickly. And I've seen this multiple times, like I said, like where your data warehouse because becomes from a data lake into what people call a data swamp. Um, or there's this like model sprawl where there's models everywhere. You don't know which one you need. You don't know which one to, to trust. Um, and vendors are, you know, eager to try to, to, to solve this problem by giving you data catalogs. Data catalogs are useful, but I believe the core of the problem is that you didn't model the data in the first place. So that's bottom-up modeling. You kind of start with what you have and you're kind of moving up without any particular direction. Top-down modeling is where you start by understanding what the business cares about and translating that into data models. So the typical approach for this starts with understanding business processes, business concepts, the metrics, the dimensions, um, and it delivers the standardized schemas like the Kimball Star Schema or Data Vault 2.0. Um, the, the, the benefits of this method are obviously because now you have a comprehensive map on the, of the entire business. So any new analyst that joins, um, any do, new data scientist, data engineer, they know where to go. They, there's a set of trusted tables that they can go and quickly get whatever they need. You, 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 it's, it's great when business processes become stable. So sort of post product market fit when the company is now in growth mode um, and the processes have, have stabilized, you can now model them with these models and be able to measure their improvement. It, it does have its own drawbacks. And one of the biggest drawbacks of this, of this method uh, is um, because building a comprehensive blueprint can take a really long time. And many of these data warehouse um, initiatives and companies have failed precisely because of this, because everybody tries to go in and do what's known as a BDUF, big design upfront. You're trying to boil the ocean, right? You're, you're, you're just basically, let me just, let me understand the entire business. And you can spend like three months or six months trying to understand the entire business before you deliver anything. And you've already spent all this money. So the best approach is somewhere in between, right? So you want to be a little bit, of a, a little bit agile and you want to be able to like quickly change models um, while they are still, um, while they are still providing value. Right. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, just quickly here, there are three types of models. There are conceptual models, um, which we'll cover in this workshop. So these are the high level business concepts that you care about, the customer, the account, the product, transaction, et cetera. And it's usually done in a, in a meeting with, with other business stakeholders and you create a diagram of boxes and arrows and you map out their relationships between them. Then the, the data folks turn this into kind of a logical model. So the logical model is when you ex expand these concepts with attributes. So now that you have a customer and an account and a product, now you wanna know what are these attributes that make up this, um, this customer, like the customer name, customer ID, customer email, customer phone number, product description, product type, et cetera, et cetera. Typically this is done as an ER or entity relationship diagram, which I'll show you in a little bit. And finally, this logical model is then translated to a physical model. A physical model is basically turning this model into tables and views in the, in the data warehouse. 
um, just because you designed it as a very nice table, right, with with the right columns, doesn't mean that that's what it's going to look like in the in the physical model. In the physical model, it may be, you know, a view on top of um, much smaller tables, or it could be one big table, um, or it could be like a, a dimensional model, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll cover all these modeling types in the workshop. So this, the physical model is usually done with SQL by using a, a tool like dbt or one of these other tools like SQL Server, Integration Services, Batillion, Dataform, all these all these tools are basically uh, data transformation tools that are used for building tables in a data warehouse. All right, so enough theory. Let's talk about an actual example. So for this example, we're, we are talking about this Sumo Travel Adventures company, Sumo TA, which offers adventure travel tours that customers buy online. Customers browse the tours online, they choose one, and they, and, and they can book it for themselves and they can add other people to the tour. The company buys these tours from suppliers who are actually the, the folks that are running the tour. So the company isn't running them themselves, although there are companies who do that as well. They're like a full end-to-end uh, -end shop. So customers go on the tour, you know, and afterwards they can write a review about the tour. And customers can change the tour before the departure date. They could change the departure date. They could cancel the tour and so on and so forth. So all this, all this information is available in the, um, in the, in the OLAP system. Right, the all app, uh, so sorry, the OLTP system, the online transaction processing system. So let's let's take a look at what the ER model looks like. Now, I don't know how many of you have have seen ER models before, so I'll explain them in a little bit of detail. And if you've seen them before, um, this will just be a quick review for you. Okay, so we have these two systems here. We have our reservation system and our marketing system. On the reservation system, so over here, these are the tables that make up the reservation system. So we have a reviews table, booking items, travelers. Um, I don't know if you've seen this notation before, this like, this is known as crow's foot notation. These like three um, things spanning out uh, this means that this relationship between this ID and the booking ID here is one to many. So one traveler uh, can book multiple, can exist in, in multiple booking items. One booking order uh, can exist in, in multiple, um, uh, can exist in multiple booking items. Uh, and over here, this is a one to one mapping. So one review per one booking item. Uh, same thing for the inventory. So one uh, one inventory ID to to the to the uh, for one booking item, but then the inventory themselves one inventory has multiple tours, um, and then a, a, a tour a, a supplier can also supply multiple tours. So this is also one too many. This may not be one hundred percent perfect. Um, I, I just made this up based on my previous experience in kind of the, the travel space. So there, there may be sort of mistakes in this specific diagram, but the, the idea here is for you to understand what the ER schema looks like. So uh, you are specifying relationships between these concepts, uh, whether they are one-to-one, -one, one row in one table means maps to another row in another table. So when you join them, you get just one row. <clears throat> One to many, so one row in one table has multiple rows in another table. So when you join them, you get all those multiple rows. And then many to many, which is typically not mapped in, in OLTP systems. Uh, typically what, what we do is we put another table in between that goes, so in, instead of you, you going many to many, you go one to many and then one to many. So you have this table in, in between. Um, I, I don't have an example here uh, I, th that I could explain that with, but this is um, 
um, this is this is the reservation system. We have we have a transactions table, booking order. We have the travelers. Notice that there is no concept of a of a customer here. We have this traveler concept, but is that really the customer? We'll see in a little bit. And then we have the marketing system, which is our website where people can come in and sort of um, well they can browse the tours. And the system emits these web events. And then we are buying ads. So this is a little bit of like an like a Google ads or Facebook ads um, model that brings in data from, from various ads and campaigns. And then we also have like an email system where folks are uh, opening up emails. We're sending emails to the customers to because this could be promotional emails. This could also be operational emails. You know, once somebody has booked on a tour, um, and the the email campaign table uh, can, contains like all, all the all the total emails that were sent, and then the email activity table has, you know, email was sent, email was opened, email somebody clicked on the email, or or the the email bounced, um, or it was spam, something like that. So this is the background for what we'll be doing um, modeling with in, in a little bit. All right, so the first, now I'm going a little bit um, fast here. Maybe I should um, see, if there's a, see if there's any questions so far. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna take a look at some of the questions before I, I, I continue in a little bit. If you have already migrated the references, is it already a logical model, not conceptual? And which book do you recommend? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about books um, in, in, at the very end. And um, is there a difference between data information modeling, data and information modeling in my system? Okay, I'm not seeing any specific um, questions that I could answer right right at this moment. Uh, so I think I will continue and see if, if perhaps later on uh, you'll you'll be able to to get answers to your questions um, in a little bit. Okay, so the conceptual model or what I call the conceptual model, what, what some books call the conceptual model, it, it aims to model this, a specific business domain. So the idea is, it's not quite data modeling, it is um, conceptual modeling. So the data could change, you know, today you're using Salesforce as your CRM, tomorrow you might be switching to HubSpot and they have a different way of mapping data, but the business domain doesn't change very often. And so it's, it's very important to model specifically the domain um, as, as we saw over here, we have a traveler's table and a booking orders table, but everybody in the business talks about customers and bookings. Okay, so it's important that we understand the concepts that the business cares about, the customer, the tour, the inventory, the booking. Typically, this is modeled through looking at the business events and processes. So uh, Kimball style dimensional modeling focuses on business processes. So for example, a customer books a tour um, and you have a fact table that tracks all of the bookings. And then you have a customer dimension and a tour dimension that tracks the specifics of the customer and the tour. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then you also map the relationship, the relationships amongst these entities, one-to-one, one-to-n or um, M to N, many to many. So for example, in our case, a customer can book one or more tours um, and a tour can be booked by one or more customers. Okay, so uh, that covers the, the conceptual model. Typically this is done just on, on the board as a diagram with, with boxes and, and arrows. You just wanna capture the top level concepts that the business cares about. <clears throat> the, I, I guess I don't have a slide here for the logical model. So I'll, I'll talk about that here as well. So the logical model in this case um, adds the entities, we'll see them in, in a little bit, right? The logical model adds the entities for all the, 
um, all these entity uh, for uh, ads, sorry, not the entities, ads, the attributes for all of these entities that, that we care about. So for example, the customer ID, the customer name, the customer email, all of that go into the logical model. <clears throat> and finally, the physical model um, maps all this stuff to uh, physical data, to, 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 to tables. And there are, I talked about four different physical modeling patterns. Um, the most common one is what's known as the one big table or the white table. So as you can see here, and this is only a, a, a portion of the 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 table that you might that might you might want to create. So for example, with DBT, you might create a table like fact booking, where you've got the booking ID, the booking date, the cancellation date, the status. But then you also have things like the traveler email, uh, their first name, their last name. I'm repeating the last name here. You have their city, their state. Then you also have information about the tour, the tour code, the tour type and the supplier, the supplier name, the supplier state, country, et cetera. Sometimes you might have like a, a, a dimensional table that's like a date dimension that allows you to slice these things by multiple dimensions. So typically in, in this table, you're repeating all these values for the tours and for the suppliers for every row that, and you have one row for, for booking so that you can aggregate things um, at whatever level that you um, might care about. <clears throat> so this, like I said, this table combines facts and dimensions in one table. It's very easy to build with DBT, very easy to understand and query. If I give you this table, you can run pretty much any analysis about bookings, right? It's very simple to do with just simple select statements. It's best suited for um, end user reporting uh, and also what's known as data marts. Uh, data marts are a subset of your data warehouse that is specific to a department or specific to a, a particular business use case. <clears throat> um, if you have like an executive dashboard, for example, this would probably be powered by uh, one of these tables. Um, these, the business intelligence tools that you might see in like Looker, Tableau, Power BI, um, Apache preset, they all natively support this type of this type of table. So you feed this table into the tool and it can automatically figure out, you know, here are the things that I can aggregate by, here's the things that I can slice by, you know, the facts and the, and the dimensions. <clears throat> but it has some drawbacks. One of the biggest drawbacks that it has is it cannot handle what's known as slowly changing dimensions. Or, or SEDs. So what the heck are slowly changing dimensions? Slowly changing dimensions are dimension values that change slowly over time. For example, the tour type and tour subtype um, might, you know, today it, it, it was called like a bike tour and then tomorrow it becomes um, like a motorized scooter tour. Right, so you you have evolved your tour categorization schema, and your table already has static values, so you, it cannot handle when these things change. So the only way to, to deal with that is by replacing, basically rebuilding the table. Right, when when you rebuild the table, you're going to lose all that history that you had in the past. Now, if you don't care about history, that's perfectly fine. You can just rebuild the table every, every day. And if your tour categorization system changes, that's, that's fine. You just get the latest values, right? It's very easy. Um, sometimes though, I've, I've, I've noticed in my experience that these loading these tables, the performance can get uh, pretty, it, 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 it can slow down significantly when the table is really large. And when I mean by a large table, I'm talking a table that has, you know, 30, 40, 50 columns and hundreds of millions of rows. Um, and I was working with, with tables that had, you know, almost a billion rows in Snowflake. That was really, really wide table and was taking, you know, hours and hours to, to, to be processed. 
Um, and by splitting it up in, into individual um, uh, dimensions, I was able to improve the performance quite a bit. And we'll go into, into how to do that. Also, schema changes are really hard to deal with. So if you want to add a new column, well, you have to rebuild the, the table, which again, loses all of history. Or if you need to rename a column, right? <clears throat> it's also like um, not quite a drawback, but this table is not really designed to be joined with other tables, although people do do that because an analyst sees a table that has some information that they care about, and then they see another table that has another piece of information that they care about. And so they join them without quite knowing like what the underlying purpose of the table was. Um, it's also a, uh, it's, it's a very rigid design, right? So it, it's, it's specific for one use case, single purpose only. And it's great if that's the only use case that you care about, like an executive dashboard. But if you're gonna do exploratory data analysis, um, this is not the right tool for the job. And I'm, I'm sorry that the slide, I think my, my, my uh, head over there covers some of the slide, um, but that's okay. Parker, why did we stop sharing the screen? Okay. We are, we are good. All right, so let's, let's see how we can take this model and move it into a dimensional model. Okay, so what, what we did here uh, from, this, from this table is we, we took out things that is specific to the traveler. So all the, all the traveler information, it doesn't change very often. It doesn't need to be here. It's not native to this table. We can move that into its own table we can take the tour information, move that into its own table and the supplier information and move that into its own table. And we get something like this. So we have the, the fact booking table, which is a much smaller table. It only contains facts about the bookings and then foreign keys. These IDs here are foreign keys to all these other uh, tables. What this allows us to do is we can keep these facts um, the same. So we, we are separating facts and dimensions on, on different tables. What that, what this allows us to do is these dimensions can now change independently of the facts. Um, and we can keep track of history a lot easier. Like we can handle these slowly changing dimensions. If there's a change in say the tour subtype, we can have a column here that says, you know, this type was active from this date to this date. Uh, that's one of the ways that's like type two, um, SCD type two, I, I believe. I, I don't remember all the details. But what that, what that allows you to do is you can say, okay, if you go back in time and you want to see the categorization as it used to look in the past, you can get uh, exactly what it, what, it, what it was. And then what it looks like today, you can, again, change your query to make it... Um, seem, however, uh, and what it actually looks like um, today. And then new dimensions can easily be added to the table. Just add another row here, a foreign key, plus its own dimensional table. Um, so that's really easy to expand the model. And this is best suited for, again, for end user reporting and for data marts. Um, but the benefits of this, as opposed to the OBTs, is that this is more flexible. You know, it's easier to, um, uh, if, if you're not only serving a particular report or a very specific use case, but you want people to be able to change things um, and be able to explore data more broadly, then you would build something like this. Um, it does have its own drawbacks, of course. Um, building this can be trickier with dbt. Yes, I've built this with dbt, and it sort of requires, and I'll tell you a little secret, you can actually start with an OBT, and then from the OBT derive all of these, all of these tables. So OBTs, the OBT could be like, an, like a materialized view or like an ephemeral model, I think ephemeral in dbt means it's a CTE, which could make the query very slow. But if you want, you could sort of build that OBT and then from the OBT, split it up uh, so that you have the dimensions into their own tables and the facts all 
living in one table. Um, by joining facts and dimensions can sometimes be slow for very large tables. It depends on the database. If you're using something like Snowflake or BigQuery, this is typically not a problem, although it could be a problem if you're using something like UUIDs. In my previous job, we were dealing with uh, unique identifiers, uh, globally unique identifiers or GUIDs. Um, and they, because they're not sorted, they're randomly spread out across the table and they were calling, they were causing full table scans in Snowflake. Uh, you can deal with this by using certain like, uh, like numbers in, instead of IDs, uh, instead of UIDs, but those are like implementation details. Um, and then adding new facts to this fact table could potentially break historical data. So I, I did get a question from someone who wanted to modify an existing fact table. And what I ended up suggesting to them is to treat it as kind of a linked fact table. So add, add a foreign key here and then link it to another fact table. Uh, so, and again, sorry, because this is covering, my head is covering some of the slides here. But this is, uh, what it says here is, this is pretty rigid, like, this is also rigid. Certain types of analysis are nearly impossible. So if you're doing things like funnel, funnel analysis, or you're dealing with uh, streams or events, or if you're doing cross system analysis or any sort of EDA, exploratory data analysis, this is not the right, way, the right modeling schema for, for that. Um, there are some better, some better ways that, that we'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, the third modeling um, pattern that is almost unknown, I would say, in the, in the business today is something known as ensemble modeling. What ensemble modeling tries to do is it, it sort of, it tries to separate these entities and attributes and relationships into separate tables. So specifically for Data Vault, they create these um, tables known as hubs. So for example, we, we have a, I took this from a book, so um, it, it doesn't quite fit our, uh, our, our travel story. Um, but the idea is that like a customer hub would just be the customer ID and a, a, um, and a foreign key to uh, like a primary key to, to the table, the, the customer ID itself, and then the, the date when it was loaded. And then everything else about the customer lives in the satellite. The satellite has all of the, um, the attributes of that customer. Um, there could be one or many satellites for a single hub. Um, and the idea is that you kind of group the, the attributes by how often they change. That's one of the ways that you can group these attributes into satellites, how often they change. Um, slowly changing dimensions is kind of like the, the big 5,000 5, pound gorilla of data warehouse modeling, which is like, how do you deal with this? And the data vault um, deals with this by basically separating things out so that you never change the hub. Um, you always change these, um, the satellites and then the connection between the hubs. So the store and employee, it becomes what's known as a link table. I don't know much about data vault. I've only read a little bit about it. Um, anchor modeling goes even further by making everything into its own table. Every, every entity, every attribute, every connection between entities and attributes becomes its own table. So you get like potentially tens of thousands of tables. But what you get from this, you get the ultimate flexibility when dealing with schema changes because this model becomes append only. You never have to change it. Whenever you want to add a new attribute, you just create new tables. It's, it's specifically designed to track historical changes. So um, if something changes over time, you want to keep a record of it. Um, and it's, it's best suited for high level business concept modeling, which is what we've been talking about so far. So um, talking about 
um, like the customer, the tour, all these things. And then the cool thing about this is then you can easily create star schemas and OBTs from this model. In fact, uh, this is what what guys like Bill Inman um, and 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 then Linstead who came up with with the anchor. Uh, this is what they recommend: is that you start with kind of a, a big model that covers the entire business that's stored in a very flexible um, model in, in in the database. And from there, you create, you can do projections, which are known as, uh, you, can, you, you can create what are known as projections, which are star schemas or uh, wide tables um, that then serve specific business needs. Now, the biggest drawback with this is that, well, first of all, there's a huge number of tables involved to, to deal with but it also requires a lot of expertise. <clears throat> you have to be very well versed um, in data engineering. Um, for it, It's pretty in, intricate to load data into it because you have to make sure that it gets loaded sort of simultaneously. So there's no disconnect between the hub and the satellite and the links. Uh, there is a DBT package, as far as I know, for data vault, um, but you'll probably need like proper training to to implement it. Um, and uh, those resources could be very ex expensive to acquire sort of early on for a company, maybe overkill early on. Uh, it's also very intricate to query. So only experts can fully, un fully understand how it works, uh, which is why they create these, these sort of projections, right? These, these OBTs, these uh, star schemas, which users can easily um, deal with. It's also pretty hard to maintain, right? So that's that's everything that I know. Again, I haven't done this myself. Uh, in with with I haven't done data vault or anchor myself, but I have do, been doing quite a bit of reading in that space. And finally, the newcomer on the scene is known as the activity schema. So what the activities, activity schema is, <clears throat> it's a single table. It's basically a time series table that has, you, um, you build it for one entity, for example, for a customer. And then the idea is that for every activity that the customer does in your company, whether the, the, the customer visits the tour page, customer adds tour to cart, customer checks out, um, customer, you know, books tour, um, customer travels on tour, customer reviews tour. These are activities that, that are very, um, uh, they don't change very much, right? So the idea is that you can store these activities as a big time series table, um, and you could capture a few features, um, on, on each activity, uh, and you, the way that you. And these activities are, are immutable. So this table also becomes kind of append only. Um, it's, it's intuitive to, it's, it, I find it intuitive to model a business through activities because, you know, a business has like a limited number of activities that, um, that it goes through. And so you can easily put that in a table like this and you can bring data from multiple systems in here. Um, the drawbacks are that the, the, the queries are require tricky self joins for doing pivoting. Um, I won't get into too much detail on this. Uh, there is narrator has implemented this and they, they have a website for uh, where they explain all of this. I've written one article where I started to explore this, but um, again, I don't have any personal experience building something like this uh, for, but I, I wanted to bring it to bring it out here as yet another way of modeling data um that you might hear or you might be interested in uh, in learning about okay so let's uh talk about recommendations here what do i recommend so if you are starting out obt's white tables are a great way to deliver value quickly you create one data mart that serves marketing or sales or executive dashboards and you are done 
right? So you all you have to do is maintain that pipeline, and uh, then you can continue to kind of grow your uh, your, your your business as things as things settle down. So OBTs, if your business is early on, uh, if if you're working for a startup, if you're the first data science or data analytics hire, uh, this is a good place to start. But this isn't the end all be all, right? The moment you start to deal with like dimensions repeating in multiple tables or slowly changing the dimensions, as I mentioned earlier, or if these OBT queries are starting to take too long, you might want to look into Kimball. And then a lot of companies stop here. You can actually build, there's, um, there's a website for GitLab. Um, I, I don't have the link, but if you search GitLab Kimball or GitLab Dimensional Schema, they basically publish their entire uh, data warehouse schema online. And they, they their documentation is online. So you can see how a real company has implemented Kimball. So you can stop here, basically. You can answer 99, 98% of questions with uh, the with dimensional schema. Um, some companies, however, choose to do a data vault. Um, so where you actually care about having like a single business blueprint, like a single extensible business uh, blueprint. There are people out there that I've talked to on LinkedIn and, and other places who are kind of data vault um, consultants, and they will say, this is the only way to model data. Um, whereas then the, the, the Kimball dimensional schema becomes kind of a projection from the data vault. Um, I personally don't have any experience with this. So um, my recommendation is, you know, read about it, see, uh, see what you can find, see what you find useful and kind of go from there. And here's some books that I have found useful. Um, and we'll make sure, Parker, let's make sure that folks have access to this, um, to this deck as well. I can, I can provide a link to it. Um, or if you want to grab a screenshot. So the definitive guide to dimensional modeling is Ralph Kimball's book. It's in its third edition, but it was published back in 2013. Yes, it is still relevant today, although a lot of the things uh, that it says only apply to traditional relational databases. So it was never updated for the cloud, uh, but it does have a lot about how to model business processes, how to deal with slowly changing dimensions and lots and lots of other things. Uh, the Agile Data Warehouse design, this book by Lawrence Kaur and James Dagnito. This book takes the Data Warehouse Toolkit and sort of updates it a little bit. And it, it, it creates this, it, it introduces this idea of business event modeling. Uh, so you, you start by like taking down all the different business events or business processes that, that occur. And then you translate that into a physical model. Uh, again, very highly recommended. If you're interested in Data Vault, this is like the Bible for Data Vault. Dan Linstead is the originator of the method, so he also wrote the book on it. But if you want like something of a more gentle introduction to Data Vault, this book by Hans Hultgren is is a pretty good model. Uh, is, is a pretty good book that, uh, where it kind of covers like what an ensemble model looks like and why do you want to break it up. Um, in, into these smaller pieces, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe that answers uh, the top question by one, which book do I recommend to, to deepen? Um, I would say start with, um, this one is probably a good one to start with, and then you can move on to Kimball's book. Um, so it, it, it's funny, like a lot of companies in, in the US tend to prefer dimensional modeling for some reason, whereas in Europe, Data Vault is pretty uh, wide, widespread. So um, I believe that answers that question. Okay, so that was it. Um, thank you very much for listening. Now, of course, this is an end here. I'm gonna be sticking around and I'm gonna be answering some questions, but if you wanna find out more about me, if you wanna follow me on all the social media stuff, I'm on LinkedIn and on Twitter. 
bio.link slash ergistx. You can also find a link to my book um, on SQL patterns, which, which was mentioned. And let's do some questions. Perfect. And um, right before we dive into questions, so Ergus, there is, and for the audience, there's the link to Ergus' book. And if all of you guys navigate to the QA section, you can upvote questions that you're interested in, and those will get answered first. So now it's time for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Ergus. Okay. Okay, so from Daniel London, is there a difference between data and information modeling in my narrative? Um, I don't want to be pedantic about terminology and definitions of things. Uh, I, I sort of see data modeling as like this big umbrella term that covers physical modeling, conceptual modeling, um, logical modeling. Um, the, I, I also don't want to get too caught up in, in these debates about what things mean. Um, as long as you are, you know, like a, a, a model is not perfect, but it's, it's very useful. So starting with a model is better than starting with nothing. Right. So, um, I'll, I'll sort of just leave it at that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if there's a, a difference. Like, like I said, I kind of use the term data modeling very, very broadly. I, I, it's very overloaded with multiple meanings. And so I've, I've gotten in, in trouble with debates in the past by saying data modeling is this, and then other people say, no, data modeling is this other thing. And so I really don't like to get into those specific debates. Okay, next question. How did data modeling practice change with cloud data warehouses? Okay, that's a very good question, right? Um, the, the way that it changed is that people started People stopped caring so much about storage limitations and compute limitations. So a lot of the um, uh, Ralph Kimball book, uh, the, a lot of the physical design that he goes into uh, about using surrogate keys and about these surrogate keys being like of integer type and about using you know, foreign keys and indexes, all of those were there because cloud warehouses did, did not exist. And so they had to deal with uh, limited storage, limited computation, and they did the best of what they could do. Now, a lot of those things apply to cloud warehouses, uh, but if you're starting out, like I said, you can get away with um, one big table. Uh, in fact, Google, I believe uh, that's their overall approach to things. Like they prefer having you know, one giant table, in fact, one of their uh, <laughs> internal modeling things is actually called big table. Um, and they ha love having, you know, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of columns in, in, a, in a single table. Uh, so yeah, the, the way that it changed is people stopped doing this like broken out um, model, broken out star schema, because with, with with something like uh, Google BigQuery and with, with with Snowflake, you can pretty much you can take a JSON blob of of everything that you care about and shove it into a single column, and then be able to pull it pull it apart at query time because things are very very fast, right? I still believe that you need to have <laughs> um, like a, a, a business conceptual model that, that actually makes sense to you and to your stakeholders because it helps with communication and it helps with um, like shared understanding across all the analysts, across all the data scientists. So I think it's important to at least do that. And then the physical implementation, you can change it. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I believe that answers the question, if not, please submit, a, submit another question. Okay, what is the query syntax for splitting an OBT into dimensional tables? Okay, so there isn't a, a specific syntax, right? So let's quickly look at the OBT and how you might wanna do something like that. 
Okay, so if if your your OBT like this is probably one big select statement, right? So select this, 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 and then you have a whole bunch of CTEs and you have a whole bunch of joints. Hopefully you're using CTEs. If you wanna learn more about CTEs and how to use them, check out my book, <laughs> shameless plug there. Um, but you might have this very large query, right? And it's a single model in DBT. Uh, so how did I break it up into multiple models? is that I, I, I take chunks of the select um, and put them into a separate model, right? So I would create, a, a, an, I'll just take like, select all of the traveler stuff, for example, and then just put it into a dim traveler model. Um, and then when I go back to my fact booking, after, after I've deleted everything, for the traveler, I just do a ref. If I'm using DBT, I'll just do a reference back to the dim traveler and that brings all the fields with it. Or I don't even do the ref. I just, um, I, I do the join just so that I can get the ID, the traveler ID. And I put the, 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 the key in fact booking and delete all the columns. So basically the, there's no query syntax per se. It's more like how you uh, break break up the query. So if you have a very large query that generates the, the OBT, take this, the portion that pertains to the traveler, delete it, put it into a new model, and then reference that model back into your fact table model uh, and just basically bring in say just the key from the dim that's how i would do it okay so from david wong isn't the obt the same as the output you get when you join your normalized tables yes that's exactly correct however there's a difference right so if your obt is um, materialized as a table and things change, your OBT will be automatically updated. Uh, you, you, like if, if your dimensions change, right? So the whole purpose of, of splitting it up is to deal with dimensional changes um, individually, separately. So if your customer stuff, your, your, your customer uh, dimension doesn't change very often. That could be its own table, but if the tour stuff changes, you might want to deal with that in, in a separate, in a separate table, your, this model here, this, this could be the physical implementation, but you could put a view on top of this with the select that makes this look like an OBT, right? So the idea is that, um, it's just, it's the difference between what you show to the end users and what, how you store the data. The whole purpose is to optimize storage um, and to deal with, with changes. But yes, at the end of, of the day, this star schema model basically projects as an OBT to the end user. I hope that answers your question. Uh, dimensional modeling versus data vault 2.0, which one should you use? Well, I've made the recommendations here. Um, I don't have any experience with Data Vault, uh, so I can't give specifics. And I also don't want to get into arguments about which one is better. Um, I think you should start with OBTs. I think you should consider Kimball um, or consider Data Vault. There is. Um, there are two articles that I've read on Medium. There's a company in the UK called, I believe it's like Pewick or something like that. They're like a, an online retailer or something like that. And they actually show how to build a factless, sorry, a lakeless data warehouse using Data Vault. Um, so you'll find examples, like this is more of a personal choice. Um, I, I, I don't have, strong opinions one way or or the other okay next question 
<clears throat> does data ingestion strategy change depending on the type of modeling? What are your suggestions on data ingestion? No, it does not change. Um, data ingestion should be independent from how you model it, right? So, but I'm, I'm assuming by data ingestion, you're talking about the extract and load um, portions of your e ELT, you know, extract, load, transform. The extract and load, that's a whole other, that's a whole other topic, you know, by itself. Um, Ralph Kimball actually has a book that he calls the um, Data Warehouse ETL Toolkit, where he talks all about data ingestion um, and all that stuff. But your, your ingestion strategy should not change based on what modeling you're doing. You might be pulling data, say, with like something like a Fivetran or a Stitch, stitch data, uh, where they handle all of the changes for you. So if things update on the vendor side, they can go in and pull that data and bring it back to your data warehouse and kind of update and merge. Um, but that should be independent for how you model data, right? That should, that should not affect. Um, as far as what my suggestions are for data ingestion, it's more of a data engineering topic. It's a little bit outside the scope of this particular workshop. Um, but I would recommend Ralph Kimball's other book on ETL toolkit, where he talks about all the specifics of like um, how you do incremental models, um, what type of incrementality you should use, et cetera, et cetera. Like those things are a little bit out of scope for this. Like I, I, I could um, literally do another workshop just on, on that. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, next question by Parker. In the context of my fictional SaaS business, which data modeling approach is the most expensive to manage in a data warehouse or a data lake? Um, so the way that you get charged in a, in a data warehouse or a data lake, um, whether you use BigQuery or Snowflake, you get charged for storage and for compute. Um, different models, like Snowflake uses, separates the two and you can use different uh, warehouse sizes from small, from extra small to extra large, um, depending on how much like CPU and RAM you use. But um, the most expensive to manage would be Oh, geez, that's a, that's a really tough one, Parker. Um, the, the one that generates the most tables, like I've seen, uh, if, if you're doing what I call bottom up modeling, that's going to be very expensive, uh, regardless of which, regardless of how you do things. Like if you're just starting with raw data that's been landed on your, on your warehouse or your data lake, and you are now transforming that data and um, building reports on top of it. If everybody's building their own report, their own data mart, um, you will, yeah, you'll get, it, it will get expensive and really hard to manage very, very quickly. Um, if you use any of the methods that I recommended, like a like Kimball or Data Vault, it should be, uh, it should get better. If you just rely on OBTs, if everything is an OBT, it's going to get very expensive. How is, how's that for an answer? All right. Um, next question from Dave. I said OBT has drawbacks in adding new columns. Yes. How is dimensional modeling better than that? Okay. So dimensional modeling, if we go back to our diagram here, Dimensional modeling is better in the sense that inside of this dim traveler table, inside of this dim tour table, you could keep multiple copies of the same data with um, the start date and an end date for when the, that value changed. Okay, so it allows you to keep a history 
uh, that's known as either a slowly changing dimension type two or type three. Um, I, I, I don't know the, the details, but the idea is that you might want to say this tour type was a bike tour from September 1st, 2020 until October 30th, 2022. And then in October 30th, 2020, October or November 1st, uh, or October 31st, rather, 2022, it became scooter tours. And then the end date is null, for example, or something um, in, in the future. You could not have that in an OBT. If your OBT was a materialized table, you cannot have that. If your OBT is a view on top of this dimensional model, then you can actually choose which one you want to show. You might want to choose to show the latest. Um, and then if an analyst wants, wants to build a report that says, here's what like bike, what, what, what bike tours look like a, um, a year ago, because if you go in the past, but now you have the new uh, tour category, it's going to look as if like scooter tours were doing really, really well in the past when they may have not existed, right? So the, the whole purpose of, of breaking it up into a, into, a, into a star schema is to deal with this like history of, of changes. Um, I hope that answers the question. Another question, how do you propose to maintain the conceptual model integrity to keep it live? Um, and um, and integrate and not only as a concept when you dwell into logical and physical models. How do I propose to maintain the integrity? Uh, if you're talking about keeping the documentation up to date, I mean that's just um, that's just a part of the process for a, like a data warehouse team to you know continually update the diagram as well as the actual physical design. Um, if you're a solo analyst and you're like evolving this model over time as the business changes, uh, that might get pretty hard to do. Um, mainly because like you don't have time to keep the logical model up, up to date. But I see it more as like documentation, right? So it's just like, any other documentation, it's it's effort to keep it up to date as things change. Um, it's just it's just part of the process, basically. Um, OBT similar to single table design for DynamoDB. I am not familiar with DynamoDB, so I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. Sounds like it, but maybe. Okay, question from Sandeep. Uh, I read some older data modeling books that they all talk about normalizing to third, third normal form. Is that still being used or is that irrelevant? Ah, that's a very good question. So Bill Inman, the father of the data warehouse, the guy that I mentioned, uh, initially in his book on data warehouse, and I have read parts of his book, he used to recommend using this third normal form. Um, that is no longer relevant. That's actually a really, really hard model to, 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 to maintain. And so later on, Bill Eman himself, and the later books that he's written, he actually recommends Data Vault. So third normal form um, should not be, although this is sort of like third normal form ish. So this does have its own drawbacks. That's why that's why these data vault practitioners, that's why they all uh, recommend data vault because it's so flexible. But then again, it comes with its own um, bag of tricks that you have to deal with. But third normal form is no longer relevant to answer your question. Who do you think should own the creation and maintenance of data model? What are the responsibilities among different teams? Well, that is a... <laughs> If you want my take, I'll give you my take. Uh, this is my, my, my own uh, kind of philosophy. This is more like a philosophical, a philosophical question, right? Who should own this thing? Um, I would say that 
that usually has fallen sort of on on my it's been my responsibility so uh if there's um back at, at in one of the previous companies where i worked at there was a da- there was an, an a business analyst team and there was a data engineering team and then my team we were called like data warehouse analysts we sort of acted as the go between uh between the engineers and the analysts and so we it fell upon our shoulders to kind of own the responsibilities for this and the, the data engineers just simply implemented what we designed and we maintained this models uh different companies have different structure uh they've structured their teams differently right so sometimes a data engineer might have to do this typically though data engineers um unless they're business savvy are not going to bother with this they just want to implement the physical model um analytics engineers or business intelligence engineers are more likely to be that team who would own something like this um data science folks maybe if they're early on um in in a startup and there's nobody else to do it they would do it but uh that's not their role that's not their responsibility so i guess i do have a take on that <laughs> okay next question can you expand on managing uids for better performance if the current data is being modeled using uids for the pks and fks what is my recommendation would you convert this to some OB types? So this is a very specific uh, physical modeling question. Apologies to those who don't understand what these terms are. In my previous company, we um, they were using UUIDs, which were randomly generated. Um, in in their in their transactional transactional tables, right? And so they were being brought onto uh, Snowflake. And because these UIDs are random, um, and Snowflake doesn't have a concept of a foreign key or a primary key, right? Neither does BigQuery. Um, uh, so if you're using one of these two for, for doing this sort of thing, then you have to deal with this, with this problem. Um, so UIDs, because they are random, uh, Snowflake if you said, you know, select star from table where UID is this, then Snowflake would scan the whole table to search for this UID. So it, it couldn't do what's known as pruning. So it couldn't make the query very efficient, right? And uh, because you cannot sort these UIDs, like if, if you had a date column or if you had an integer column, it, it can sort that in increasing order. And so if you are searching for ID, 5,000, it knows that it's not anywhere in between one and 4,000, and it's not anywhere between 6,000 and 10,000. So it can like prune, it can take all this stuff out and only search in a small portion of the table, making the query much more efficient. Okay. So what they would recommend for us is to use something that's known as ULID. You can look that up. I think ULIDs utilize like a time feature that they're basically sortable um, by timestamp. So uh, my my recommendation would be either use ULIDs or switch to using integers. Next question, how do you deal with duplicates in OBT? Oh man, duplicates are the bane of everybody's existence. Uh, you got to remove them before they land in your table. Um, if they're in your table, you're basically reporting the wrong numbers. So you got to you gotta do that in your SQL that generates the OBT. You got to use whatever methods y- you know to be able to deal with the duplicates, even as far as doing distinct, which I really hate doing. But um, yeah, deal with them before before they get into your table. How do you avoid boiling the ocean and deliver quick wins? Okay, that is a very good question. Um, in this book here, the Jim Stagnito Lawrence Core book, or this one, Agile Data Warehouse Design, they have a very good approach at how to be agile with data warehouses. 
they recommend something they, they called JDUF, which is like just enough design upfront. Um, and the idea is that you, you do you do enough, you start with an OBT, you, you start with a single model, and then you evolve it over time. But you need like, they need a lot of TLC, tender love and care. Like you need to be refactoring code. Uh, you need to remove duplication. So every, every table only has the stuff that it actually needs. Um, but um, yeah, start, like this is a good book to read if you're looking for, for, um, for Agile. Although I guess the Hans book also has some Agile concepts. Like the idea is you, you put just enough design to get started and then you evolve it over time. Oh, I guess the, the question, okay, it got downvoted a little bit. This was Othman's question. Costas's question, could you describe a practical pattern, simple steps to follow on actually loading a star schema, facts and dimensions? Um, <clears throat> well, like I said, there's a, the trick to actually loading something like that is to, I mean, you could start with an OBT up front and then break it up. Um, but what, one, of the, one of the problems that I've seen is like you load some data in one table and it's missing from another table. So when you join, it doesn't work. So you have to figure out how to load them in, in, with DBT like in parallel, right? And then so that then if the next step uses, so if, if before you build your fact table, you have to build your dimensions and you want to build them all simultaneously in parallel and they all should ref, um, they, the, the fact table should ref all of them. And so it will wait to be built before, uh, or it will wait to, to be built until all these other tables have been um, fully, fully built. Um, I don't have specifics, I, I guess, if it, to, to answer your question, but just like overall design, it's like um, run them in run them in 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 parallel. Figure out how to do with DBT so that they they run in parallel. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a it, it's a tough question. I can't answer that in in thirty seconds. Um, how do you work to identify the first business unit event to focus on? In developing a data modeling type initiative, I would say go where the money is. So what I mean by that is um, what's the one thing that they care about the most? Is there an executive dashboard that exists? If, if that already exists in place, then go, go to the next department um, that needs it. Typically something like marketing because they're bringing in a lot of leads. Uh, they might need, they might be next on the list. So my, the priority queue would be something like this, like executive dashboard should be first, um, something like a marketing team should be next um, and anything operational, uh, sales, IT, et cetera, that could be sort of like, it, it's like, you know, rank them based on how important they are or in terms of how much money, like, Go where the money is, basically. <laughs> um, that question was already answered by Othman. Okay, next question. Does making an, an OBT of you improve performance uh, compared to a table? No. Uh, views, as you know, get executed every time. And so if somebody, if you load a view into a Tableau and somebody is interacting, there's queries that get generated every time they click on something. And unless the query runs in milliseconds, uh, it's gonna suck. The experience will be terrible. So you only make an OBT of view if you've, if you've optimized the underlying data to be very, very, very fast. Um, like if you're using, um, yeah. So views are never, Good one. Okay. Do you suggest using natural keys or surrogate keys to join the table? I'm um, I'm ambivalent to that. The only reason you'd use surrogate keys is to make queries a little bit faster. So if if your 
natural keys were strings and your surrogate keys are numbers, so like integers, they would be much, much faster. Um, but if, if the original keys were numbers, then yeah, that would be really fast as well. Uh, why do I say dimensional modeling is hard to do in DBT? It's harder than OBT, sure, but most things are. Well, that's that's what I mean, right? Um, basically, I listed them in the order that in the order of difficulty. OBT being the easiest, dimensional modeling coming next, something like a data vault or anchor model uh, coming in next in the difficulty scale. So. I'm basically making the same point that you are, which is that it's hard. It's harder than an OBT, um, but yeah. And, and, and so it requires that you kind of know what you're doing. I'm not necessarily saying that it's hard full stop. I'm just saying that it's harder than something like an OBT. Um, all right, next question, uh, probably the final question. Do you have a rule of thumb on the number of columns that are added to a wide fact OBT where you determine it might be worth shifting to dimensional modeling? Uh, I don't think of it in terms of number of columns. I think of it in terms of how long it takes to load the table. Um, I've reduced the loading time of a table from four hours down to one hour by splitting it up into, from, from an OBT to a, to a dimensional table. So if you have like an SLA that says you need to deliver data every hour and your OBT starts to take 45 minutes, uh, then that's when you start to think about breaking it up. All right. Um, those are some incredible Lots questions. If we did not get to your question, don't worry, you can let me pull this up again. Um, if we did not get to your question, you can join the LA club. That's where Ergust is. That's where tons of other data professionals are. And you can ask him directly via DM. And with no further ado, thank you very much, Ergus. That was incredible. Uh, and thank you everybody for the active participation and for all the questions. Um, we will send this video to everybody in less than 24 hours. So expect an email for that. Um, Ergus also said that he would like to share the slides for this. So that's a great opportunity for everybody. And with that, have an amazing rest of your Thursday. Enjoy Friday, enjoy the weekend, and we will see you for the next webinar in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much.